Uh, good, good morning, and thank you very much for this very kind invitation. I'm really, I'm really pleased to be with you today. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you. And thank you to the previous speaker for the excellent uh, presentation. Uh, in the next few minutes, we are going to discuss a little bit about the first-line choices that we have for a metastatic colorectal cancer patient. Uh, I uh, live and work in uh, Sardinia, which is one of the two main islands in Italy. Uh, as you can see here, and here's a couple of um, pics of my um, my hometown, which is Cagliari. Uh, you can see the university building here. We are celebrating 400 year uh, since the foundation of the university right now. This is the hospital where I work. And this is one of the beaches for which Sardinia is very famous around the world. So you're very, very welcome to spend your holidays here, if you like, in the next uh, future. As soon as we can travel uh, freely, uh, we hope that that will happen very soon. I think that there has been a, a very nice shift in the way we, man, we manage and we discuss about uh, colorectal cancer patients. And I think that we shifted from uh, a vertical way to discuss colorectal cancer, uh, where basically um, we have one line after the other, first line, second line, and third and fourth line. But now I think we are more on a circular way when we treat and plan strategy for metastatic colorectal cancer, because we have many, many more options uh, not just only new drugs, but also new strategies, so, such like um, reintroduction, rechallenge, surgery, radiofrequency ablation, and local regional treatment. So sometimes it is very difficult, maintenance, for example. So sometimes it is very difficult to understand whether a patient is receiving, let's say, second or third line. When we discuss patients uh, um, in uh, the MDT, Sometimes uh, uh, we cannot say whether the patient is receiving second or third line because it's more circular than vertical, which uh, uh, in some, under some respect has made things very difficult because, of course, we have, to, we have so many options, so it's not always easy to plan a strategy. But in the end, uh, uh, we also observed a great uh, and an improved advantage, especially in terms of overall survival for all our patients. But yes, there is, uh, you know, a choice which is crucial to the management of the patient, uh, uh, which is the, the first line choice where we can balance between clinical and biological factors to decide what to do uh, for our patient and to plan the strategy that would be uh, the first strategy for our metastatic patient. And I, I thought that it would have been uh, interesting to um, uh, test our strategy uh, with a clinical, with a couple of clinical cases, which can help us through the presentation. So we have here a 50-year-old teacher, uh, and we can see the, um, the patient history is a male, 50 years old, no prior malignancy, some coexisting uh, comorbidities, but not very serious, like diabetes and hypertension, but under control with medical therapy. And you can see here the medical history. In September 2014, rectal bleeding, abdominal pain, and diarrhea, and constipation. And he was diagnosed with uh, a primary tumor located within the sigmoid colon, so it was left-sided. Um, and it was managed exclusively with colectomy, so he received only surgery. In the end, it was a stage 2 colorectal cancer, PT3, N0, uh, M0. It was well uh, until March 2017. Uh, when a CT scan revealed, uh, uh, unfortunately, multiple liver metastasis, uh, as you can see here in this, uh, in this slide, and multiple lymph nodes. Uh, the performance status was perfect, so it was perfectly fit and it was uh, adequate to receive uh, any treatment that we should be planning for him. Uh, there are a lot of drivers that we can use to select our first um, line choice in, uh, in a patient like the one that we pictured a few seconds ago. And you can see here a slide from the ESMO guidelines. Basically, we rely on treatment characteristics such as toxicity profile, flexibility of treatment administration, socioeconomic factors, and quality of life. But we also uh, have to consider patient characteristics such as age, performance status, organ function, comorbidities. And something that, at least in Italy, it's, uh, it was really new, patient attitude and expectation and preference. I mean, when we have... Uh, 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 treatment strategies that uh, can offer uh, almost the same level of efficacy, but maybe with a different toxicity profile or a different way of administration, 
the attitude of the patient, his own expectations and preferences can be very important. So I think that, uh, you know, it's really a new thing that we have to discuss also uh, these um, options with the patient and take into account the opinion of the patient when, of course, the, uh, there, is, there is an equivalence in the um, activity of the options that we are offering. And, of course, also tumor characteristics are very important, such as clinical presentation, tumor burden, tumor localization, and tumor biology. We, we already had a very beautiful presentation about tumor biology, especially, uh, of course, RAS mutational stages and the rough mutational stages. In the end, I think that the aim of the treatment, are we curing the patient, is, is cure the aim, or are we just palliating the patient, is very important. Tumor sidedness is really crucial, and the molecular profile, uh, RAS and BRAF, but also MSI, HER2, and DPID um, in some times. So basically, I think that RAS and BRAF MSI uh, should be considered mandatory, and the rest uh, uh, pretty much depends on the availability that you have with your own pathologists, with your own uh, laboratory that can may offer or not other biological um, evaluation for your patient. And we know that tumor sidedness is just a rough way to indicate a different biology. Uh, we know that uh, left-sided uh, primary colorectal tumor are more common in men. They have chromosomal instability and they are derived from the hind gut. On the contrary, right-sided are more common in women. They have more often microsatellite instability and they are derived from the mid gut. And there are a lot, many, many more than the one that you see here in the slide, um, biological signatures that are more often present and uh, more often frequent, uh, frequently represented in right-sided versus left-sided. But we have to know and we have to um, admit that there is no a specific signature uh, individuating right or left-sided. It's more a continuum of molecular alteration. So uh, PRAF V600, he is more common in right-sided, but can be also be present in left-sided, for example. So there is no specific signature and no molecular alteration, which is exclusive for right or left side. Uh, we know that tumor sidedness is uh, prognostic. Uh, unfortunately, patients with right sided colorectal cancer uh, usually have a worse prognosis than patients with left sided. But what about the predictive role of tumor sidedness? And uh, we have data, very nice data, from two phase three randomized large clinical trials uh, uh, investigating the role of cetaximab in combination with chemotherapy versus uh, the same chemotherapy in combination with bevacizumab, and also data um, from a small phase two trial investigating chemotherapy plus panitumumab uh, versus chemotherapy plus uh, bevacizumab. And in the end, uh, the data uh, can show us very clearly that patient with uh, Raswell type left-sided colorectal cancer when they really have an improved prognosis when they are treated with an anti-EGFR in combination with uh, chemotherapy. And we also have this um, uh, data combined together in two different meta-analyses. This one here is from um, Annals of Oncology uh, three years ago. Uh, you can see here that there is a clear advantage for left-sided metastatic colorectal patient post wild type in terms of overall survival and progression-free survival when they are treated with an anti-GFR. And there is also uh, a shift in advantage uh, in terms of overall survival and progression-free survival. It's less clear than, uh, than what we see for left-sided, but maybe that is because the, the number of cases is lower. But anyway, there is a shift, a very nice uh, indication that uh, patients with right-sided uh, may have an improved overall survival and progression-free survival when they are treated with bevacizumab in combination with chemotherapy. And those data have been replicated in this different meta-analysis, basically uh, analyzing uh, the same trials and, uh, of course, uh, meeting the same conclusions. Uh, so uh, getting back to our patient, um, this patient is a 50-year-old teacher in very, very good condition with few comorbidities, but very well under control. Uh, what do you think, uh, what other biological factors do we need to plan strategy for this patient? And I think that this is a voting moment. Uh, so uh, do you think that we need KRAS and RAS, KRAS and RAS or BRAF, or KRAS and RAS BRAF MSI, KRAS and RAS BRAF MSI HER2, or all the above uh, plus others? And please vote. And then let me know what you voted 
and so we can discuss. There is no right, quest, uh, right answer to these questions. Uh, it, it pretty much depends on what your practice is. So you can freely vote and then we can discuss about the, the different options. Uh, that's what we did in our patient. We uh, uh, analyzed Ras and Virachan and it was, it was wild type. It was microsatellite stable. Uh, professor, was uh, dear, dear, dear professor, dear professor, please uh, allow time for voting. Dear professor, please stop for voting. Thank you. Okay. You, you tell me when the, thank you. You tell me when the voting is over and now we go on. Thank you. Голосование uh готово? -huh. Uh, distinguished professor, for the fourth option, KRAS, NRAS, BRAP, MSI, HER2, more than 50% of attendees voted for this option, therapeutic option. As you can see in the slide here, I would have chosen exactly the same options. And uh, uh, it was a couple of years ago. Uh, so I think I think that the options, RASB, RAF, microsatellite, instability, are, two, uh, are the main options that we can uh, check for our patient before planning strategy in, in this case. Uh, in my institution, we also uh, check for um, uh, the hydropyrimid in the hydrogenous deficiency. This is not you know, super common uh, across Italy or Europe, but uh, we have a very nice link with our lab and the lab is doing it very quickly. So we think that um, it might be something that can help us to select uh, also for the dosing of fire fuel. There are some uh, indication that if you, if the test is available at your site, you may tailor the dosage of IFU and avoid uh, very rare but very serious um, toxicity with the use of IFU. And you see that the patient was raspiraf well type, stable, microsatellite stable, HER2 negative, and heterozygous for the, the hydropyrimid in the hydrogenase deficiency. Uh, so basically, we had to start with a lower dose of IFU. And uh, so we are now to the treatment choice. Uh, so we should consider what is the treatment goal for this patient, what is the optimal combination of treatment, what options have the greatest evidence in left-sided RAS wild type, is there evidence for a target agent with the selected backbone, and what are the current guideline recommendations, not just, of course, in, in Italy, but also in Russia, uh, in, the, in the United States, ESMO, NCCM, what is the optimal management of the patient? And once again, we have option. Uh, Fold Fox Fold Fury plus Cetaxumab, uh, or Fold Fox Fold Fury plus Panitumumab, Fold Fox Fold Fury plus Bevacizumab, or Fold Fox Fury plus Bevacizumab. Please vote and let me know when the voting is over yes. and uh, so we can discuss the options. Uh, коллеги, Dear colleagues, please vote. We vote for options for variants. Uh, dear professor, uh, 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 viewers and indies, uh, they have different opinion. For Fall Fox Fall Fury, Setuximab. For Bevacizumab, 40%. Panitumumab, 26%. And Setuximab combination, 25%. Again, um, in this case, there was no uh, correct answer. I mean, it, it, once again, it depends on the uh, on the strategy that you are using in, at your own center. But I would not use, um, in this case, I would have not liked a lot to use a combination of chemotherapy plus bevacizumab because the patient is left sided and, and is all ras wild type uh, and also b raf wild type. So there is, a, as I would say, a very, very clear indication to, to use a combination of chemotherapy in, uh, with an anti-EGFR agent. 
And uh, at our center, I, I mean, also the, um, uh, of course, we have the choice to use a panitumab or cetuximab, but uh, the, most of the data that we have uh, at the moment, I would say 80% of the data that I showed you and the meta-analysis are derived from trials uh, with the use of cetuximab. We are very used to, uh, to use cetuximab for our patients. So the, our choice is, uh, was to use a, a combination of Fofox uh, uh, with, um, with cetuximab for this specific patient, left-sided, uh, all well type and uh, in very good uh, clinical condition. So let's take a look. We um, evaluated the response uh, at two, a month two, uh, showing early tumor shrinkage, as you can see in the slide here. And then at month four, once again, it was, we, um, we had a, once more response uh, continuing with treatment. And then the patient uh, maintained stable disease um, at month six, eight, and 10. And from month six, uh, he re received cetuximab in combination with fluoropyrimidine as a maintenance, which is something that we usually do. I mean, we do not like a lot the use of cetuximab or panitumab monotherapy as a maintenance. We, we try to use it in combination with fluoropyrimidines. And uh, for the anti-GFR, uh, we think that the optimal combination is with the infusional fluoropyrimidines, but I'm very curious to hear what is your opinion. Uh, unfortunately, at month 12, uh, the patient progressed with multiple lung uh, metastases, as you can see here. So we have um, a male patient who left sided raspiraf well type uh, uh, that is started the first line with herbidox plus Fosfox. Uh, he, we observed the partial remission. He did not have a lot of um, uh, side effects from the treatment. Uh, uh, we usually use prophylactic management of a skin rash with, uh, with oral doxycycline, basically, for a couple of months just during treatment. And this is, uh, I think, it's a good option to prevent the, um, the, uh, um, uh, the, the um, a skin rash in your patient. At this point, what do you think that um, the patient should receive? I mean, the patient is progressing after, I would say, 12 months of um, uh, chemotherapy in combination with herbidox. So what would you do for Fox cetuximab, which is a reintroduction, basically? Or would you switch to an antiangiogenic drug for Firi plus a flibercept, or for Firi plus bevacizumab, or just best supportive care? The patient is still in very good clinical condition. Please vote now and let me know. What's your opinion? Dear colleagues, once again, under your screen, there is the opportunity for voting. There are four options, uh, reinductions, uh, uh, return to full Fox with uh, Reduximab, full Freeze Plus. And all these options that the professor has listed. Or maybe are there other approaches of therapy that can be possible in this situation? Please vote. Our opinion, your opinion is important to us and to, to the professor to understand the reality we are living now and uh, the knowledge of the situation and uh, opportunity for treatment. Uh, voting is uh, very active. I think uh, the majority of it, uh, of you is uh, the uh, are for antigenic therapy. Some uh, change uh, combination changing from full fox to full free re and some uh, add bevacizumab like uh, anti antigenic uh, medication but uh, the majority have chosen full free with aflibercept thank you um, i think that the choice to shift uh, um, changing chemotherapy backbone, but combining this, in this case with an anti-angiogenic drug would have been uh, my choice uh, as well. 
because I do like um, the reintroduction, especially when the patient is uh, on maintenance. So uh, basically, uh, this patient did not progress during full fox cetuximab, but, but it progressed during maintenance. But it progressed outside the original area because if we remember, uh, the patient at the at presentation had only liver and lymph node metastasis, but now the patient is showing with lung metastasis. So when a progression is outside the original area or is a bulky progression, I do not like reintroduction and I would have gone for uh, a, a switch uh, to um, chemotherapy in combination with an antiangiogenic drug. And once again, I do think that the combination, the sequence uh, um, cetuximab uh, followed by aflibercept is a very good one because of course uh, aflibercept is um, capable of inducing response rate, like uh, cetuximab is able to induce response rate. So I think that my choice was to use full theory uh, of Libercet. Uh, we do not have a lot of trials indicating the, the right sequence. We only have um, subgroup analysis from large trials uh, suggesting us what, what could be the right sequence in specific group of patients. And uh, basically, I like to show uh, you the um, results of this subgroup analysis from the FIRE 3 trial, where you can see the patient receiving uh, in line full theory plus cetuximab. Uh, most of these patients received an antiangiogenic drug, uh, mostly bevacizumab, uh, following progression. And on the, on the other hand, patient receiving full theory plus bev, first line, in most of the cases received uh, an anti-GFR in combination with uh, chemotherapy. And you can see the results here. I mean, uh, I was really, really amazed uh, by these results when they have been first uh, presented because uh, it was really nice to observe like uh, um, progression-free survival during second line, so PFS2, and overall survival during second line was you know, clearly influenced by our choices in the first line. I mean, there is an effect in the first line that is uh, following progression and is translating into second line because the patient with left-sided primary tumor receiving uh, cetuximab first line, the yellow line here and here, and then switched to receive uh, bevacizumab or aflibercept, a combination of an antiangiogenic drugs uh, with chemotherapy, do have the best overall progression-free survival and overall survival. So what you select in the first line may have an impact also in the second line. And basically, we also have a meta-analysis summarizing this result, putting together different studies. And what comes out in the end, with, I, I know it's not at the highest level of evidence that we can have, but it's a very nice level of evidence. Uh, we have that the perfect sequence, especially for left-sided, is anti-GFR followed by an anti-angiogenic drug. So we selected the perfect sequence for, uh, for our patient. Uh, so now we can discuss a uh, second patient. This is a 60-year-old lawyer um, with uh, hypertension, diabetes, but under control. Uh, she had positivity at a fecal or occult blood test, and then she was diagnosed with the primary tumor located within the right colon with multiple liver metastases, unfortunately. And the biomarker status was RAS, the rough wild type, uh, DP, uh, DPYD um, normal, HER2 negative, and microsatellite stable, good clinical condition. And you see here the PET scan and the uh, MRI showing the, the, uh, the level of involvement of the liver, which was really huge. So based on all the consideration that we usually make when we try to select the perfect choice for this patient, which strategy would you apply? Surgery on the primary tumor and then first line uh, or immediately first line with 4 fox 4 theory plus cetuximab or panitumab, so an anti-GFR plus chemotherapy, or uh, bevacizumab plus chemotherapy, or a triplet, uh, 4 fox theory plus bevacizumab or a triplet, plus cetuximab or panitumumab. Please vote now. Let me know what you think. So, will you please take a vote? I'm addressing participants. So, uh, shall we continue, Professor?
Yes, dear professor, shall we continue? I think we continue. We have, uh, there, so we have some problems with voting, so should we continue then? Mm -hmm. Proceed. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, we, uh, we know that this patient had uh, localized disease, liver limited, like uh, you know, many patients with localized disease, they have uh, liver limited disease. And we know that patients that this is just only one of the case series of the many case series that we can show indicated that patient with resectable metastatic disease that actually uh, underwent resection uh, usually have an improved prognosis. So with a patient with liver limited disease, the optimal aim would be to resect what is now um, unresectable. Uh, I think there are two different groups of patients with liver-limited disease. Um, patients with biologically challenging disease, I mean, it's uh, not unresectable under a surgical point of view. Uh, your surgeon would say that you can easily resect the lesions that you see in the, um, in the picture here. But maybe there are prognostic factors contraindicating immediate resection of metastatic disease because uh, the um, uh, the risk of recurrence is very high. And then we have technically challenging disease where you need conversion therapy. And when the surgeon is unable to resect the patient, uh, uh, and uh, you know, my surgeon would tell me, yeah, I can resect this lesion, but I'm very likely not to resect everything and I will leave an R, uh, let's say one, so the resection would not be complete. So please shrink the tumor, convert the tumor to resectability. And these are the prognostic factors that we use to um, uh, until now, that we used to uh, indicate the prognostic uh, level of our patient. Of course, the, the number of uh, the number and size of the metastasis, the level of um, the tumor markers like CEA, uh, the disease-free interval if the patient has received the surgery on the primary tumor, and the presence of lymph nodes, metastasis, and so on. And of course, also BRAF and tumor size is a prognostic factor for patient with liver-limited uh, disease. Uh, in case our patient is a biologically challenging patient, so surgically, technically resectable, but with um, a worse prognosis, then we use neoadjuvant peroperative treatment. And the only trial that was positive was the APOC trial, randomizing FOLFOX perioperatively uh, versus uh, immediate surgery. And the, the trial was positive in terms of progression-free survival, and, but not in terms of over survival. But the primary aim was progression-free survival. In patients with technically challenging disease, uh, the, you know, we, we, we should aim to uh, a combination chemotherapy allowing the highest possible response rate. Basically, uh, the more difficult surgery is and the, the worse prognosis is, and the more we select the best uh, systemic therapy as a conversion therapy. Uh, what is the cytoreduction for patients with right sided What is the relevance of cytoreduction? I mean, in this case, the relevance is conversion to resectable disease. And in most of the cases, when we think of cytoreduction for patients with liver-limited disease, uh, we think uh, about conversion to resectable, which, of course, is one of the main targets uh, for our patient. But th there is also prevention of impending organ dysfunction, avoidance of impending clinical threat, and alleviation of severe symptoms for other patients. So cytoreduction is important under several aspects, not only uh, for conversion to resectable. And uh, we had a very uh, surprising uh, um, results when we observed the results of the meta-analysis um, published by Arnold in terms of overall, of overall response rate. Because yes, patient with right-sided seems to have uh, um, you know, an improved overall survival and progression with survival with the use of bevacizumab with chemotherapy, but that is not true for response rate, which might be improved with the use of an anti-EGFR. And this was really surprising and uh, brought to generally to admit that if we want response rate, the use of an anti-GFR with combination with chemotherapy might be allowed uh, also for right-sided, of course, Raswell type patient. And there is also this uh, very beautiful uh, subgroup analysis, very small with, the level, uh, with a very low level of evidence, but I think we are very uh, important impact on our practice, subgroup analysis from the FIRE 3 indicated that early tumor shrinkage for right sided patient is improved with the use of cetuximab plus chemotherapy. And patients obtaining early tumor shrinkage, they also have an improved median overall survival compared to the same group of population treated with bevacizumab in combination with chemotherapy. So basically, the, uh, the suggestion here is 
that we can use uh, uh, cetuximab in combination with chemotherapy for ras type right-sided patient if the aim is response rate. But maybe we must be a little bit more cautious in evaluating response and evaluate response a little bit earlier than what we do usually for the other patient. We have to check a little bit earlier just to be sure that the patient is responding because if the patient is not responding, that might be a sign that we should change chemotherapy and shift to an anti-angiogenic drug. Uh, so what is the, the optimal strategy for our patient? We already discussed this and uh, we know that uh, removing surgery Removing the primary tumor may have a prognostic impact, but the tumor burden in the liver was too massive. So we thought that uh, the, we, we did not have the time for um, removing the primary tumor and uh, start chemotherapy. We would not uh, like to miss the chance, the therapeutic window for this lady. And we selected to treat the patient with a combination of chemotherapy plus cetuximab. And you see results here in, in, in terms of um, MRI and in terms of the tumor markers, which decreased with a very nice uh, response in the liver. So the patient received the Fox plus cetuximab and she had a very nice partial remission. And uh, the, the next question will be, what well, now? Uh, would, would, we, would you continue with Fox or cetuximab? Or would you switch to maintenance or would you go through MDT discussion, once again, to evaluate if surgery is now feasible. Uh, I think that we can, you know, move on with the decision because discussing uh, uh, in the MDT, I think uh, it is very important for this patient. And uh, that's what we did. And the patient was operated with an R0 surgery on the liver and primary tumor. And then we had the options to continue treatment for this patient with six more cycles of Fofox plus cetuximab or six more cycles of Fofox alone or observation. I mean, there are no clear guidelines, uh, you know, indicating what is uh, appropriate as an adjuvant after the resection of liver metastasis. And um, I mean, you can continue with chemotherapy alone or use cetuximab. We usually complete six month treatment uh, just um, to, to have, you know, the, the, the best possible effect uh, for, for our patient. This is the last case, um, a male, <clears throat> 64 year old. Uh, <clears throat> you can see here that he had diagnosed with stage one colon cancer six years ago, and it was managed with surgery and follow-up. Then he had hepatic recurrence uh, during surveillance TC and he had a primary tumor uh, located within the left colon and, and five hepatic metastases. Uh, it was a uh, Raswell type, a BRAF mutant, uh, HER2 negative, and MSI high, and in very good, uh, op in very good general uh, condition. This, these are the, the slides uh, indicate, uh, showing you the CT scan. So uh, this is a very good question because, of course, uh, until a few months ago, uh, the answer would have been very different. But what, what would be your choice for the first line? The triplet, the biological triplet for BRAF mutant, binimetinib, bencoraf, and ipsetoximab for, for chemotherapy plus an anti-GFR, the triplet plus bevacizumab, or chemotherapy plus bevacizumab, or a triplet plus an anti-GFR, or maybe uh, um, immunotherapy with pembrolizumab or nivolumab plus ipilimumab first line. Uh, this is a very, you know, good question because uh, the patient is VRAF mutant and MSI high. Uh, that, I mean, the first line immunotherapy is not registered, not reimbursed in Italy at the moment. But we all, uh, I think everyone saw the very nice presentation of the keynote 177, basically phase three trial in MSI high patient comparing uh, Pembro uh, versus uh, um, standard chemotherapy for this patient and uh, we know that the primary endpoint was met and uh, so I think that there sh should be a change in the way we treat this patient uh, in the first line. So at the moment my first choice would be um, of course pembrolizumab uh, in the first line. And then we also saw the um, update of the Beacon trial showing uh, that the effect of the doublet um, uh, and corafenib cetuximab was very similar to the triplet and was superior um, to the control 
uh, once again, reinforcing the idea that the biological uh, doublet or triplet in some subset of patients is the optimal choice for, for BRAF mutant. But in this case, the trial was in the second line. So the optimal sequence for this patient would be, in my mind, first line immunotherapy and then um, uh, the biological triplet, which is something that we can now do in the, in the practice. Uh, so yeah, uh, we uh, we observed um, that uh, the um, management of this patient uh, has shifted from a vertical way to a more circular way, which is uh, somehow more difficult for everyone uh, that uh, is uh, um, uh, involved in the cure and treatment of this patient. And I think that it is difficult, but it, it pays off because there is an also a very nice increase in terms of improved overall survival progression free survival quality of life so it is more difficult but uh, we also uh, can help our patient to obtain more uh, from their treatment and i think that the key uh, to elaborate the, the you know the optimal strategy for metastatic colorectal cancer is the multidisciplinary team and it is something that we cannot do without in our practice and it is something that i think can help us to uh, select the best and the appropriate strategy which uh, for this patient uh, thank you very much for your attention.